Um, Sam is, um, or I have to correct myself, was principal of FAT architecture from 1990 until uh, 2014. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he just became ex principal of FAT because they decided, as only uh, good rock bands do, to give up uh, the office the moment they were at their peak, uh, which is quite exceptional in the scene of architecture today. Let's see if they do a reunion tour in a couple of years. Um, but until then, we will give us a lecture about themselves, uh, I suspect, or himself at least, and about John Soul, which maybe is a more difficult double than we have imagined at first. We even call it dangerous. So I'm very curious. Thank you very much, Sam. Maybe I need to tell that uh, as fat, and I think it's more or less their last project, uh, they will be. Uh, responsible for the pavilion in the Biennale in Venice, uh, the upcoming Biennale. Uh, they're very busy with that, and he just explained to us that despite the fact that they stopped the office, they're working more vividly within that same office framework than they ever did before. <coughs> Sounds very much like a rock band which splits up and does the last two, no? Yeah, it's like, um, it's a bit like the White Album, to be honest. <laughs> um, Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's lovely to be here on such a sunny day in this lecture theatre. Um, but, uh, of course, I came here with the invitation to talk about difficult doubles um, and to talk about John Soane. Well, um, I tried to think about that, but what I ended up doing, I think, is to, to, to talk about um, something else. I think I got scared of comparing you know, our work to someone so famous, and so widely regarded, so canonical, um, and I got a bit distracted. So you'll have to bear with me. Uh, and instead of hearing about how much I love John Stone, which I could have talked about, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the idea of the double and how that's been, uh, I guess, really important in the work of the soon-to-be-defunct um, FAT, um, which I've kind of retitled as well, from difficult to dangerous. So the dangerous double, architectural doppelgangers and reenactments. This is the subject, really, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so. To start with, really, is the idea of the doppelganger. And the, the doppelganger is a, is a peculiarly modern myth. Um, so it's the, the story where there's another version of you who looks identical, who walks the earth. And um, if you encounter this facsimile of yourself, it basically presages your own death. Uh, and it's a, a myth that emerged in a, at the time of uh, the sort of romantic movement and it's a very gothic idea too and I think it's a modern myth because it threatens a very modern idea which is us as individuals you know us as like people with free will um, us with, with own, our own personal responsibility the ability to construct our own identity within the world um, and it's of course a myth that's accelerated incredibly since the Second World War, the baby boomers kind of the, uh, 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 exemplify the uh, idea of the individual, I suppose. Um, and it's an idea which has pervaded architectural culture since, I suppose, the 20s, since modernism, and has accelerated again in recent years. Um, and so that idea of the architect as like an individual auteur, uh, someone who's both heroic and original, and whose work is as unique as their own signature. Um, and that their work essentially is, a, is, a, is an expression of their own absolutely remarkable, absolutely special personality. Um, and so this is the sort of myth, I think, which has built the possibility of, of, of the idea of the star architect existing. And it's encouraged them to you know, express themselves in extreme forms of self-expression uh, so kind of unchecked by any other uh, um, um, 
uh, issues, just to, just to let their own personality loose on the world at the most vivid, large and expressive scale possible. But of course, <coughs> it's a myth. Um, and it's a myth because we can look back and see architecture at different moments having a very different set of sensibilities. So here's uh, Stuart and, and Revit, uh, and these are two uh, English guys who are measuring up antiquity. And what they're doing is essentially making a set of drawings which they take back to England in a book. This is the book. And what this book did was, was give English architects who on the whole had never left the shores of, of the island access to a whole new language. So this, along with the Grand Tour, along with like thousands of fragments of the ancient world being essentially ripped out of their sight and taken back to the homes of the aristocrats in, in England, essentially gave birth to a new kind of architecture, which was the English Baroque. I suppose the, the, the interesting thing here is that the, 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 a new kind of architecture comes out of a, an attempt to copy, an attempt to remake all of these things which they see through drawings, through fragments and so on, into something which actually exists in their contemporary circumstance. But in the act of copying, they make something entirely different, entirely of its time. So you could think there of the, 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 the sort of act of copying as being something which on the one hand is totally unoriginal, but also something which originates something entirely new. So the problem of the copy, I suppose, is the, is the problem of how it threatens our contemporary sense of self and it explodes our idea of the individual. Um, and it upsets us psychologically. And we see this through many morality plays, such as Superman 2, where an evil version of Superman, here you can see him getting pissed on a whole bottle of whiskey before he tries to uh, destroy the world, um, is, a, is a version of the evil twin, the evil twin is the same but opposite. So it's an inversion of the morality of Superman. It repurposes his, his, his intent. All of his powers are used for evil rather than for good. And you can see the slight changes. You can see stubble, the expression in his mouth, the location, the drinking, and so on. This is the anti-Superman, the inverse of, uh, of, of the good version. There are other versions. Here's Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, a person with a double identity. On the one hand, the civilized. On the other hand, the totally barbaric. And this perhaps suggests that both of them reside within, within us, that we're both the good and the bad version of ourselves. Or in uh, Dostoevsky's novel, The Double, where the protagonist, who's a, a kind of lowly, bureaucratic clerk, suddenly finds that his double turns up. And his double is just like him, apart from he's funnier, a little bit better at work, uh, more successful with the ladies, has, seems to have a little bit more money too. To. And this double essentially totally um, uh, uh, torments the original and sends him into a, t a complete psychological tailspin where he finds himself essentially <coughs> insane and then he dies. So the, the, the sort of apparition of the double is a thing which um, destroys the original. So the myth of the doppelganger, I think, asks us questions. So this image asks, what do you do? What would you feel some dark night if you met yourself face to face? And I think this is something which happens to architecture right now. Um, in architecture, when we're still wedded to the idea of the original, does the doppelganger, does the architectural doppelganger presage architecture's own demise? And does it present the same kind of disturbance as an evil version of Superman? And maybe there's some evidence that it does. So um, here's... Uh, <clears throat> The Farnsworth House and Philip Johnson's Glass House. Um, the first a, a tribute to the second, even though it appeared in the world as a built form first. And of course, Mies himself hated the Glass House. He was driven crazy by the way in which even his most devoted acolyte, Johnson, could simultaneously pay tribute to him 
but also kind of insulted him. So when Musa came to visit, he was so disturbed that he couldn't remain inside it. And uh, Johnson had to call the neighbor um, to, to, to put Misa up for the night. There are a series of other uh, copies, and I think looking at some of these copies is quite instructive on how the copy works uh, uh, as a kind of a force in and of itself. So here's uh, an example. Um, it's St. Peter's in Rome and uh, Our Lady of Peace in Yamasukro in the Ivory Coast, which is, to all extents, a kind of gigantic copy of St. Peter's. Now, when we think about copies, I think one of the things we need to think about is like how they come into the world, why they come into the world, what they're doing, why they take on the form of something else. And in this case, there's a, there's a story which begins to explain why it might want to look like something else from a different place and a different time. So the, uh, the author of the uh, replica was the president of the Ivory Coast. Now, the Ivory Coast isn't a Catholic country, and Yamasukro wasn't the capital of the country, but he decided to move the capital to his birthplace. So it was a very small town, and this gigantic building was built there. Uh, it's the largest church in the world, and it was, in, it, it was um, inaugurated by the Pope himself invited from the Vatican to come and kind of consecrate this, this building. Now, there's stories about why that might have happened, because it's a kind of, you know, it's a completely unnecessary thing to, to build, it's a completely unnecessary thing to do to invite the Pope. And it might not be as simple as simply wanting to have something fancy in your backyard. And in fact, the story goes that it was... Um, Partly the opposition to the presidents was organized by the Catholic bishops in the Ivory Coast. So the fact that this was seen as a gift from the president, in a sense, to the Vatican, was a way of channeling the power of the Vatican onto his side in order to help suppress the opposition of the, the bishops. So in a way, the fact that it appears to be St. Peter's is a way of, I guess, rerouting a certain kind of authority and rerouting that authority unbeknownst to the Vatican into another uh, set of hands so that the power can be displayed uh, and used in a slightly underhand way so that the, the gift here is like a Trojan horse it contains something else um, there are other examples too for example here we have uh, the Austrian town of um, Haustadt which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the uh, basis of something being a World Heritage Site is it has to be unique. That's one of the reasons it's going to be protected, is because there's nothing else like it, and it's really special. Now, the citizens of Hallstatt were very upset when they heard reports that a replica of their town had been built in China. And indeed, there'd been a series of Chinese spies hanging around in Hallstatt taking photographs and making drawings, taking them back to China, where the replica city was built. Now, first of all, the citizens were dismayed. It was threatening their unique identity. What, what were UNESCO going to do? Now there were two Hallstatts. Um, but the mayor decided that this, this was an opportunity, that instead of it being a kind of... Uh, a, a, uh, an insult, instead of it being a kind of lowly copy of them, he thought it would be a chance to establish a very unique relationship. So a real twin town, in a sense. So now they go backwards and forwards between Austria and China, and these two towns have a very unique relationship. So the fact that they look the same, the kind of physical twinning of them, is a form, I suppose, of diplomacy. And another political uh, uh, a ramification of the copy. This is uh, the Villa Rotunda um, and another <coughs> Villa Rotunda in Nablus in the Palestinian territories. Now, um, <coughs> the replica, which is an incredibly fine replica, absolutely amazing. We'll see a few more later on and I think you'll agree that this is, this is really the best 
the best replica of the Villa Rotunda you'll find. But it was built by the uh, self-styled richest Palestinian, so quite, I mean, quite a significant um, figure, and especially a significant figure in the, kind of, in the politics of this contested territory. Now, it's a very strange thing to build a replica of the Villa Rotunda in such a place, I think. But there's a reason. He argues that building something which is, I guess, a symbol of a certain kind of uh, Western enlightenment on the top of a hill in the circumstances where the Israelis are uh, um, uh, building as a kind of political act was significant, that it would make it much harder to send in the bulldozers to demolish a replica of the Villa Rotunda than it would a traditional Palestinian settlement. So there's more architectural versions of it. So this is ARM's version of the Villa Savoie, which is black and rubber and part of the um, Aboriginal Museum in uh, Australia. So this inversion of a European modernist kind of icon into something which is quite literally its opposite, black instead of white, soft instead of hard, um, I think shows how a deliberate act of copying can be quite an aggressive uh, attack on a certain set of ideals, especially given the, the, the context of this project, which is, I guess, a way of Australians dealing with their own murky colonial past. And sometimes the copy is, I think, just astounding in its technical expertise. So here is a really boring place in China called Thames Town, um, which is a place, one of, these, one of these developments which is supposed to look like somewhere else, uh, which had a kind of heritage to it, which makes it easier to sell. This one's supposed to look like a little bit of England. And you can see it here. It's quite a good approximation. Not bad, not bad. But when you strip off the outer layer, you find something far more remarkable. So this is like in situ, cast, concrete replica of this vernacular type of house. And I think this invention, this kind of complete sort of reverse engineered uh, version of the vernacular is the, co is the copy at its most exciting and the most powerful. Uh, another story from China. This is uh, um, Ronchamp, obviously. And like many other things, it, it, it got built in, in China. Um, but the uh, Le Corbusier Foundation uh, got wind of this construction. And somehow, with their amazing legal might, they're one of the most powerful organizations, I think, in the world, probably far outstripping the FBI in their reach and uh, uh, um, effectiveness. So they forced its demolition. But once demolished, you can see here the kind of ruins and a version of the open hand um, statue. It became a barbecue restaurant. So the studs, of the, you know, the remains of the, of the walls are still there, some tables and a tarpaulin. And this is something, this is I guess a, a restaurant that's formed out of the intersection of copyright laws, um, slavish copying, um, and in that intersection, it created something new. The ruined Ronchamp barbecue restaurant. A fabulous idea. Um, and then, of course, there's things which make us, I think, wonder about the idea of the double, of the copy. So here's Lakeshore Drive for Mies van der Rohe. Um, version one. 860, version 2, 910. So both involve two buildings, one a copy of another, turned 90 degrees. And then there's another version of the same project built a few doors up the road. So there's essentially all kinds of doubling going on here. But completely intentional, but at the same time entirely mute. Like why on earth would there be so many versions of the same thing in the same place? Um, I think there's something in many of these extreme examples that goes to the heart of what architecture does. I think one of the things which architecture 
really has at its command is the fact that it takes the fictional and it makes it real. And there's nothing more plausible than myth in terms of fictions. There's nothing we believe more than really great myths. And myths essentially naturalize, I guess, the most outlandish of concepts, the most kind of abstract of ideas, so that they feel normal, they feel natural, they feel like they've always existed. Um, and I think architecture is involved in this um, because it takes the imaginary and it takes the conceptual and it turns it into the most undoubtedly real physical stuff that surrounds us. Um, and it takes ideas of economics and politics and history and society um, and it turns them into the world around us and it turns it into the world around us so that we actually believe that it really exists. <clears throat> And I'd argue that what that really is, is architecture performing as a kind of enactment. And enactment means two things. The first of it has a, a theatrical meaning. So uh, this, is, this might be how a play is scripted, the stage directions and so on. And I think architecture scripts us too. You know, it tells you guys to sit there me stand here, you to listen, because of the format of the room. Um, it performs as a sort of social machine, in a sense, formatting behaviours and so on. It operates like a script or a score. Um, but it also performs. So if this is the script of Hamlet, this is the performance of Hamlet. So architecture has the equivalent of uh, actors' gestures, costume, uh, expression, and so on. All of the kind of acting out that needs to, that needs to happen in the theatre happens architecturally too. So the way something looks, um, its materiality, uh, its decorative and surface qualities, um, are all ways in which architecture performs, how architecture expresses, I guess, the script that, that, that lies behind it. And this theatricality is, is essentially a way of taking a fictional idea and making it real, performing it into the world. But the term enactment is also a legal term. So it's the moment that something becomes law. Um, and so that's, I suppose, when the kind of words and ideas and debate um, that, that, that go on prior to uh, a law being made, it's actually the moment that it become something that we have to obey. And so this is the British enacting clause, which goes at the front of every bill that goes in front of Parliament. So as soon as this is signed, it's law. So the act of enactment makes it real. And I think architecture also is that. It's the moment where the abstract ideas, which, which uh, I guess architecture expresses or embodies, become undoubtedly real. But more often than not, I think architecture works through the idea of re-enactment. And it's a transition that we see again and again. So here, classically, is uh, an ancient wooden Greek temple, which later becomes this, which is a stone, essentially a stone version of a wooden temple. So there's a real transubstantiation of the material and something which creates a real weirdness as its materiality changes. So the residue of, the, of its history as a wooden hut is still felt in its stone construction. So you see the dentils, which were necessarily part of the timber construction of the way in which you put the wood together, suddenly become carved out of stone in a way which is completely redundant in, uh, in stone construction. So the word, you know, the, it essentially becomes a decorative, rhetorical device. As though, the, I guess, the, the history of one object is contained within another. So that here you see, I suppose, technology and culture remaking the original into something which is new, but something which is a, essentially a re-representation of itself. Um, I guess a modern version of it might be the digital desktop, which is a kind of a version of uh, uh, the thing which your desktop actually sits upon. 
And I think something happens when we restage things, when we reenact things. And often that thing is, is really a rearticulation of power. The fact that you choose to re-represent something become, is a way of magnifying its, its significance. And so here you can see, um, this is when um, Obama makes a big announcement, or in fact, the US president makes a big announcement. This is him announcing the assassination of bin Laden. And on the left is the real announcement, the, the live version. But every time he makes one of these big announcements, um, he is then re-photographed making, as though he was making the announcement. So on the left is the, is the real, on the, on the right is the restaged one. And when we see the restaged one, it looks far more authoritative, it looks more, far more significant, it's uh, just the quality of the image, it's centered, it's symmetrical, and so on. Um, it has the right lighting, the color balance, and the poise are correct. And it's a typical way in which, I suppose, presidential authority is staged and restaged. So here you can see left and right various announcements being made. So the idea of the reenactment, I suppose, makes, um, makes the copy, makes, makes the uh, kind of uh, uh, restaging of it in a way more real, more powerful, and I suppose in, in a way more authentic, more true to the real nature of the announcement than the original. And I think this is a moment that describes a really fundamental condition of reenactment. Um, so, what you have is the raw political fact on the left, like the actual action, and the second is the symbolic version of the same thing. But I think one of the things we've, we've try to do in the office is to work with these kinds of ideas, but to work in ways which kind of undermine them or, or cut into them or cut against them. So one of the projects I'd like to show you is um, a version of the Villa Rotunda that we built, uh, I guess, two years ago now for the Venice Biennale. And it was a project which really addressed the act of copying as a fundamentally architectural in fact, there was nothing else apart from copying in the project. And we began with the Villa Rotunda because it is perhaps the er example of the thing which gets copied in architecture. In fact, it's something which actually comes out of copies. So you could think essentially of Palladio reappropriating, taking elements of classical architecture and reforming them into a new typology, so one form of copying. You could think of the, the plan as something which copies itself through symmetry again and again. And you could think also of Palladio's kind of invitation for other architects to, to copy through his um, publications. And so here's a, a kind of a little, a little chart of just some of the versions of the Villa Rotunda which had been built. And they've been built at different scales, at different times, for different purposes, by different kinds of people. Um, and in various forms as well. So each iteration takes on a slightly different quality. And so here they are, copied back onto each other. And here are some examples. This is the original. This is Chiswick House in London, which was designed by Lord Burlington, which is kind of often credited as the springboard of the English uh, Baroque. So interestingly enough, again, copying being the moment which is not just the end of something, but the beginning of something else. Here's Thomas Jefferson, Monticello. And here we are in Nablus, again, with what I think you'll find is a, a remarkable version of the Villa Rotunda. Um, in this process, we didn't want to, to really involve any design at all. We, think, we thought that perhaps there was a way to make a project which, which was all copy all the time and simply no 
self-expression whatsoever. So instead of uh, beginning with a drawing, we began by looking for something that we could essentially steal. Um, so our original uh, was drawn from Google Warehouse. And here we found a bunch of SketchUp versions of Palladio's villa, each made by, we assume, some kind of amateur enthusiast. And the models ranged in quality from really crappy, blocky models to very accurate. Um, and I think this was the one we, we eventually chose, which had been downloaded something like 35,000 times, which is a very weird thing to think about. Like, there's 35,000 versions of this model of, of the Villa Rotunda sitting on people's hard drives. What for? What are they using them for? I've no idea whatsoever. And anyway, we have downloaded it once and did this with it. Um, what we wanted to do really was to, was to turn the process into the concept or the concept into the process. And we started by taking the model and slicing it into a, as a, into a quarter. So the sort of essential element of the Villa Rotunda, the thing that's repeated across its axes of symmetry. And we wanted to use that as a way of remaking it. Um, and the process we used was that of casting and mold making. So something which is actively about the transmission of substance into versions of, of, of something. So on the, the red is the mold and the blue is the cast that comes out of that mold. So the idea was to, to essentially display the stages in the process. And by doing that, what you'd create is four very different, I suppose, conditions. The first is the inside of the mold. And the inside of the mold would be where you have essentially the inverted outer skin of the Villa Rotunda. Then you'd have the cast, which comes out of that, which in an ideal world would be a perfect replica that, that's, that's born from the, from the mold. You'd have the inside of the cast, which would be a gloopy part, which displays the fact of material getting shoved into the mold. And then you'd have the outside of the mold, which is some kind of framework which holds it all together. And in some senses, what, what this is doing, I suppose, is, is, a, is another version uh, of symmetry. But instead of, it being, instead of it being an imaginary line where one thing on one side of it is repeated on the other, what you have is the opposite being repeated. So you have essentially positive to negative, inside to outside, that switch. So here is a view looking at the inverted exterior, which of course does things like turns columns instead of being solid into voids. So they're things which are the opposite of being structural. But it's also to do, I suppose, with the transmission of information from one state to another, from the digital version to the mold to the cast. And that process itself, I think, brings a whole range of changes. And I suppose, I think that's another, that's another argument in terms of the, 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 the mechanism and the machinations of, of how the copy works, is the fact that through the transmission from one state to another, it inevitably alters. And so here you see it almost as though it was Palladio's own sort of elevation section cut where you see the outside, the inside, the positive and negative, um, the mold and the cast one set against the other. <coughs> Um, I'm going to show a few, few more fat projects before we break up the band and before we never show them again. Um, and I suppose what, what I'm going to try and do is explain them in relation to the idea of enactment, I, I think, or the way in which the projects take a fictional origin and try to make that fiction into a reality. And certainly one of the key issues for us has always been 
representation, that buildings are much more about representation than they are about, uh, our buildings have been much more about representation than they have been about anything else, I, I would say. And this is a very early, if this was, if this was a, um, uh, a concept, this would be our like early single, I think, perhaps an EP, maybe. Um, but it's a very small house and office in the East End of London. And what it does essentially is take the program and make it its subject, and make it into the image of the building itself. And so here, looking from one end of the street, you can see that it's entirely fictional, that the image is not real, that it's you know, about this thick, that it's almost like a billboard. But as you come around to the other end of the street and look back, it takes on a much more solid form. So in that sense, it, takes, it, it certainly plays with an idea of theatricality, that it plays with an idea that it is, it is performing itself. And yet behind the flatness, something else happens, almost like the interior doesn't quite join up with the outside. So it has the kind of, I suppose, romance or glamour of being behind the... So here, I suppose, we're essentially occupying the space that the image on the exterior creates. So if the image is pure representation, um, the organisation and spatial... Uh, in the habitation of the interior, a completely different set of principles. And in fact, the difference is part of the kind of enjoyment of the project. So when you get up to the, the top, which there in that, that row of three windows is supposed to be the kind of scaled down office block, it becomes the arrangement of windows for, for the bedroom. And so this, I suppose, has the, the, the quality of, if you walk up to the top of the Statue of Liberty. And from the outside, you see this gigantic woman. And from the inside, the top of her crown becomes a set of windows. So the difference between what you see from the outside and how you experience it from the inside, I think here is like magnified entirely. Um, those ideas, I think, of, of performance, too, that we've explored, um, especially in our early days, long before anyone would trust us with a budget, we made a whole series of projects which were to do with the idea of architecture as something which could be constructed without walls and floors and all the things which architects usually resort to. Um, and they were to do with, I guess, trying to reimagine how one make, might, might make an art gallery not as a building, not as a kind of traditional white cube, but as something else entirely, as, as a, essentially as a performance. So this was a project which involved plastic shopping bags, so really shitty, crappy, cheap things. Um, but it involved using them in a way which gave them a kind of value which was not intrinsically held within them. So we commissioned, I think, 30 artists to make prints, which were then printed onto the shopping bags in a kind of uh, limited edition number. So there were 500 of each. To get one of these bags, you'd have to go to a shop in a particular area, buy something, have a transaction, and you'd get one of these bags. And depending on whether you knew what it was, depending on whether you valued the work of the artist, you might keep it or just chuck it away. So what it was doing, I think, was twofold. One was interrupting uh, a, a fairly banal transaction in the city with something else. So the, the line between what might be culture and what might be commerce was, uh, was blurred. And secondly, the value of the material itself was brought into question. Depending on how you looked at it, its value changed. And here, essentially, is the form of the gallery, which is a group, you know, a bunch of bags which are walking down the street, getting onto the bus, uh, going home, perhaps being, you know, your empty bottles being put in them, taken out for the recycling, or hung on the wall. So the life of this kind of gallery, I suppose, is much more to do with what happens to it rather than what it itself is made out of. 
And really these projects were asking the question, can architecture be conceived of as an act rather than a building? But of course architecture is rarely an individual act. It's something which occurs at the intersection of many, many people, many bodies, many interests, from project to project. Uh, these, this the collection of, of people changes. And architecture is often given form by that very group. So rather than it being something authored simply by an architect as an auteur, it's something which is a kind of manifestation of the machinations of the project by clients, users, builders, and so on. So this was a project for um, uh, a housing association, so social housing in a, a town called Manchester in um, the north of England. And it was brought into, uh, into the world because it had to be done to remove these houses, which was where a group of residents lived in an old 1970s estate, which was scheduled for demolition in order to make way for this kind of exciting metropolitan regeneration which characterised Britain in the, I suppose, 2000 up until the crash. So this is the kind of archetypal Blairite New Labour revisioning, especially of the industrial, or the ex-industrial north. But um, our project was kind of caught between one kind of aspiration, which was this, which represented, in inverted commas, world-class architecture. This is the kind of thing which the clients would say, um, the kind of thing the architects would say. But then this was the aspiration of the people that we were literally working for, who were the people who we were rehousing. A really traditional idea of a British home. And visiting them, we found places like this and inside their homes. So incredible versions of do-it-yourself. So and if you could even understand or even explain this image, I think it's remarkable. It's like half timbered, an adobe heart, like everything else all in one place or something like this, like completely compressed into one object. It's like a whole pub been reduced into like one square meter pretty much. So t total invention, of course, to to things which none of us would ever, could ever bring ourselves to do completely outside of the, the kind of taste regimes which we, uh, I guess, are uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, educated into. So the project for us really was about, I guess, combining these two worlds, one which was the kind of the idea of world-class architecture, the idea of, uh, I guess, good design, all of these in inverted commas, but also with this kind of odd vernacular working-class taste which the residents kind of held very close to them. And the project really developed out of a dialogue between the two. So here you can see the elevations, which are obviously kind of false fronts, full of reference, on the one hand, to vernacular housing, even the material, so it's brick, but with patterns which are overscaled as though they're super graphics. So it's really taking a set of, I suppose, really familiar, really conservative ideas and images of home, and then treating them with a kind of avant-garde set of techniques, cut-ups, overscaling, repasting, and so on. So you have jumps between one and another, which are completely you know, unconventional, but using an entirely conventional language. So, the, so what's happening, I suppose, is holding both kinds of ideas, both kinds of taste regimes, kind of simultaneously at, at the same time with equal importance and generating something out of the, the way in which those two worlds can, can work together or work against each other. And this, was, um, this was Terry. So he was the one who had the, that, that bamboo bar and we were totally disappointed when we went back to visit everybody after they'd moved in. And we said, Terry, 
Terry, why is, this, why is your place look so clean and so modern? And he said, well, I live in a modern house now. I can't have all that old stuff there. So it, it's a project very much about, about taste. And sadly, it, it also wreaked its own effect on the residents' taste. Um, but taste has been, I think, something which has, has been very important to the way in which we've thought about architecture. Taste not in terms of good and bad, but taste in terms of a culture or, or a series of competing cultures. And certainly in Britain, the idea of taste and the idea of class, the idea of value, are all intrinsically related. So when people in Britain certainly say good taste, they mean a certain thing. What they don't really mean is an aesthetic. What they really mean is upper middle class. And when they mean bad taste, they mean working class taste. And so there's a sort of encoding into, an implicit encoding of these ideas of class, these ideas of power, of ideologies, into the most ephemeral parts of architecture, the stuff which, as architects, we often don't even consider, the wallpaper, the carpet, and so on. The real surface decoration, I think for us, for a certain moment at least, was the point where we found a real political possibility within architecture, the thing which was usually dismissed, the thing which was usually thought of as being the most ephemeral piece of, uh, of, of uh, interior design, was in fact the most highly charged. So, um, thinking of architecture as a performance, thinking of it as a kind of a, a, as, as a sort of scripting in a sense, as a way of turning instructions and codes into a material form. And I think that's one way we can think or redefine an idea of function, a thing which tells us how we should do stuff. So it brings to mind, I suppose, Churchill's phrase that we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And in the form of a bathroom, which I guess is the kind, was the kind of first battleground of modernism, where it's, it's kind of uh, uh, war on um, dirt and, and disease was, was waged, um, the, the idea of function, I think, is incredibly significant. But it's function as a, a very kind of narrative idea. So if you watch any adverts for... Um, uh, um, shampoo or toothpaste, for example, you can still read into them essentially a kind of modernist idea of, of hygiene. But there are other things which happen in bathrooms too. And this was driven by, I suppose, uh, that weird sensation. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, in, I've never actually met anybody who's, who's had it, but I've seen it in films where people have two basins, one next to the other. So I guess the the couple can brush their teeth at the same time. I suppose that's what's supposed to happen. Um, this was a project which was supposed to celebrate Britain. And to celebrate Britain, uh, the, our client thought a really good way to do that was to use celebrities. So, that, so they decided that they wanted a house, and the house would be lived in by a whole range of famous English people, people uh, who the, everyone around the world would recognise their names. So there was like Sherlock Holmes's living room. Um, this was uh, David and Victoria Beckham's bathroom. So we thought that we would somehow uh, get around this really obnoxious idea that the only way you could possibly say anything good about Britain was to cite David Beckham by delving into their deep romantic love for one another, for which they are obviously very famous. And we thought that perhaps the bathroom was the ideal place to explore this kind of intimate connection, partly because it's a place which is really connected anyway. You think of all the plumbing, all the pipes, one thing going into another. Um, and that that might be a way in which we could take the idea of function but explore something as ridiculous as cloying, overblown, uh, romantic love. So here was a kind of doubling of a bathroom. And you can see the, the doubled basin, the doubled bath, 
um, the doubled shower, which kind of begins to loop around each other like a Welsh love spoon. So the kind of plumbing itself becomes an expression of a kind of intertwining. But of course, there's the dark side of any kind of intimate relationship like that, which uh, eventually results in something entirely perverse and entirely disgusting. Um, by the time an architect comes near a project, it's pretty usual for a project to have existed in many forms for a long, long time as policy, as an investment plan, as a spreadsheet, as a political intention, as a community aspiration, whatever. And often these things exist in a kind of conflict. Um, and the architect's job is sometimes to try and bring those things together, to try and resolve them. So this was a project which essentially brought together in this ridiculous form the different sets of aspirations which were, which were put onto our desk. These were the kinds of things which we wanted to pull together, which was basically a housing block which could be part of a big regeneration project um, that could accommodate all kinds of lifestyle. And our approach really was to was again to try and not really design anything but to just place things together and to place things which had within them I guess an embodiment of a certain set of ideas. So you can see here a little chalet with a big housing block attached to it which would support a little high street of, of houses and then through the block you'd walk through to experience it in various ways. So this is the section of it and here they are. And there it is, sitting on the chalet. So it's a really dumb idea, a really dumb idea of how architecture might be made out of some kind of collage. And like collage, it works on the kind of association that each particular element has. And the fact that you put them together, rather than join them up, but kind of put them next to each other, generates, I suppose, a certain kind of impossibility, but also a certain suggestion of the possibilities of living within it. Uh, there's other ways that, that things perform. Uh, and I suppose material is one thing too. Um, so objects can speak and they can speak through how they feel and how we use them. So this is a stool, very simply made from a cast of a bust of Hercules. And as a stool, it talks about a particular relationship to history, to this classical demigod um, skewered in the ear by the uh, um, stainless steel legs, lying as though it's a bit of a ruin, um, suspended above the ground, um, it's a sculpture repurposed as a stool. So there's that set of meanings, but it speaks materially too, as it's cast in foam. So when you sit on this demigod's head, it bulges in accordance with you know, to make you comfortable. And it assumes like his nose goes out of joints and so on. Um, so it's material performance, the fact that it kind of, you, well, the fact that you're treating it with a certain irreverence, the fact that its form changes as you sit on it, I think uh, uh, shifts the meaning of the original. So here a direct copy simply made in another material and repurposed with another use uh, alters fundamentally the meaning of the original. And finally, a project which talks about the relationship of a certain kind of theatrical performance, a certain kind of writing of collective fictions and the making real of those fictions, making public those fictions, um, a project where the performance becomes its really fundamental function. And it's a project in the outskirts of Rotterdam, in a, essentially a kind of suburb that's split from the centre of Rotterdam. You can see uh, the grey parts of the map 
is, is really the industrial part, so the big ports and harbour and so on. The, uh, uh, you can see metropolitan Rotterdam, and then you can see the satellites in pink of the town where we're working. And this is a map of the town, the top of which is actually an oil refinery, a petrol refinery, and the bottom part is the town which was built essentially to serve that kind of industry. And there you can see the refinery above and the town below. And it's a typical sort of 50s, 60s, post-war, um, uh, quasi-socialist uh, new town, I suppose. When we were asked to go there, we, were, we, were, we, were, we, were, we weren't briefed with a particular building that we had to produce. What we were briefed with was to have a response to it. And what we began to see was a kind of fictional idea of the town expressing itself on the surface of this existing place. So essentially the kind of dream of, an, of, of a place within a place. And it was dreams expressed in moments like this. So a, a carriage lamp jacked into the municipal power supply. Or the way in which planting might be used in the front garden. Or the decoration of an absolutely ordinary front garden, which once you start to look at it, begins to reveal an incredibly autobiographical account of a place and a person. So here, you know, you have uh, <clears throat> a tiny pond, a massive capstan, which you can tie a gigantic ship next to, uh, crazy paving, uh, very bad pieces of topiary, a rockery, all kinds of things which, in a very reduced form, in a really kind of, uh, I guess, shorthand way, are referring to much grander, much bigger, much more significant kinds of ideas. But it does it in a way which none of these things make sense. There's a real juxtaposition, so one thing against another, against another, against another, which becomes a very rich environment. And we were interested in this kind of richness and interested in this kind of communicative quality and interested in, I suppose, the kind of architecture which does this, like San Marco, full of stuff which is communicating, full of stuff which is telling you stories um, in a bombastic manner. Something which is really significant at the heart of a community, one might say. But we also knew that we had a budget which was much more to do with this kind of building, the most generic, most ordinary um, the kind of building that you can literally phone up an order and will come and be delivered. So I guess our work was really thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about how they might join up into one thing. So we began to look at how the generic might become specific, how it might be turned into something which would be able to tell incredibly direct Stories, the stories as kind of as, as clear as the most kind of basic of cartoons. And a building set in a landscape which was also equally narrative, equally about telling, I guess, stories about the origin of a place and about the future of a place. And meanwhile, a brief was being developed and tested, not as a document, but as, I guess, a series of events. So as a summer festival. So here you have, uh, I think this is some Dutch line dancers, very big in the outskirts of Rotterdam, line dancing. Um, so through, I guess, a, a a kind of programmatic coming together, a way of bringing together very disparate parts of the community, so young and old, black and white, uh, um, all the kinds of communities within a place which, are, which have been very fragmented that might be able to be drawn together into, I guess, a much more synergistic kind of relationship into a landscape like this, which itself was made out of essentially a kind of collage, a collage of act landscapes of activity, so lake and beach, hill, football field, um, forest, uh, and so on. 
and with an architecture which was entirely about its image. And the image was derived from the place itself. So here you can see the really simple building, but the quite elaborate decoration that's applied to it. So around the entrance is this incredible eruption of artificial trees sprayed with a gold polyurethane uh, uh, coating. So the most unnatural trees you could possibly imagine. You can see the, uh, the cladding of the building, which refers to the chimneys of the oil refinery in the background. <coughs> you can see here on the park elevation that the building starts to become the landscape itself. It starts to become essentially a kind of scenographic reflection of the land around it. Whether that's industrial, whether it's natural, or whether it's domestic. And you can see how the building itself becomes part of the landscape. So here, the cafe, where the artificial trees become three-dimensional objects within the park as the doors to the cafe open. And essentially, the inside of the building is like being, I guess, behind the scenes. You can see out through the scenery into the landscape. So each iteration, the furniture, these little bridges, this is to a little playground for children, is a kind of overly signed, overly kind of uh, um, referenced object. So this is both highway sign, tree, and garden fence. Here's a, a, a bench, which is both a log and a seat at the same time. So something which is both completely cultured and completely natural simultaneously. Sometimes it wasn't even enough to make things look like something. They had to have the words stamped out of them so they become incredibly communicative. And really, the, the central idea of the project is, the, is to make real a cultural program, and a cultural program with a social agenda. And it uses the idea of narrative to make that work. So the narrative quality of the architecture is really the thing which pulls together everything else. So function is really its image. The fact that it looks like stuff, the fact that it, it tells you stories, is the way in which it begins to operate socially. At least this is our argument. Um, and so working with these kinds of collective conditions, which are at once familiar, but put together in a way which is or reconfigured in a way which is slightly abstracted, in a way which is quite, quite unusual, is essentially a way of making a new architectural language specific to this particular place. So it turns, I suppose, an idea of fiction into a certain sense of architectural reality. So reenacting all of these scenes is a way of, I suppose, making the architecture unique, a place where we can see something of the mechanics that enable architecture to perform. So I think This, this idea, I think, of how representation, um, doubling, copying, which I think has been something which the office has looked at, I think, right from the, right from the outset and right till the end, I can say now, um, has really been a question of, of thinking about how architecture makes things real. It's looked at things which are purposefully unreal, which pur purposefully reveal the fact that they're fictions as a way to underline, I guess, the power of architecture to make things natural. So revealing the fact that it's working, revealing the fact that it's having that effect upon people. And I think that's really the exciting uh, uh, position that architecture has, is it exists between this imaginary world and the real <coughs> world. It's really the fulcrum between one and the two. And it's the actual mechanism which makes all of those kinds of ideas about society become the world that we inhabit. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, Sam. I mean, we have the, a tendency to, to ask for some questions, and very often we do that by at least starting with a question or sort of a reflection on what you presented. Well, of course, if you're very right to, to avoid soon and to talk about the difficult level, that's uh, interesting enough, um, in your own terms. Um, I must admit, when we ask you to talk about soon, it was perhaps much more evident to ask you about Venturi, but for many reasons uh, already Yoshi Tsukamoto talked about Venturi. And again, in your presentation, uh, there's so much Venturi that it's almost absurd to ask about it. Um, at the same time, maybe to ask about Venturi in an oblique way, I, I would like to I, I was know to what extent the language as you present it, um, you claim it is, of course, it's also a matter of argument that you try to represent things which somehow people could connect to. In many of your projects you say that. But I, at least it might be my perception alone, but very often the, abs the language is so much about overlaps of forms and other forms that it becomes extremely abstracted, oh. much more abstracted than what we see with Venturi's uh, direct pop sensibility. So, so I was wondering to what extent uh, it's a kind of a, a, a remix or a kind of an entirely a fuck up of, of Venturian language uh, which you almost consciously put in a mixer so it becomes unreadable. Uh, and that unreadability seems to be extremely important in your work. You don't talk about it. But, uh, I mean, I see clouds which are somehow echoes of Victorian details which are at the same time trees but not also thinking clouds. Uh, very confusing. And, and what's behind all that? I think when we... Uh, I suppose it must have been about the... the early 90s, must be about 93, 94, when we somehow discovered um, postmodern architecture, and specifically Venturi and Scott Brown. And it had been something which we hadn't been taught at school, because it was when we'd been at school, it was the thing which no one should talk about. It had been like a recent moment of the past which was so appalling that everybody was so shocked by it that they would never speak of it again. So um, we bookshop, so you could buy architecture books, incredibly cheap. But of course, they were the books which nobody wanted. And just leafing through them, it was it was astounding because what we saw to to that moment, and I think if you think of when I suppose even the most interesting of that kind of work came out, which was sort of late 60s, early 70s, so a time of real, I guess, um, uh, profound change in society and technology in society uh, uh, in, in the way in which ex people experience the world um, in relation especially to popular culture mass culture dissemination of images so the kind of world that I suppose Marshall McLuhan was was writing about and you think about where they were coming from the kinds of things they were interested in doing which was joining up or at least contrasting canonical architecture with the vernacular of the popular landscape, I suppose, um, and an architecture which was interested in communication, was interested in information, and at that time, I suppose, we felt that it was amazing that this stuff wasn't the substance of what architects were thinking about and architects were, were, were looking at because it seemed even more relevant to an age you know, which has only accelerated, which is to do with information and images. Um, computational power it wasn't to do with the way in which images flashed around the world. It wasn't to do with the way in which we relate to... to uh, uh, um, it also because we felt we lived in a far more communicative information age. 
of um, uh, how, I suppose, in relation to something like sampling, so the fact that you could build a new thing out of other things, and that one of the things you can do with sampling is to begin to lose the meaning. So it's not always about the direct reference. It's about the way in which one thing joins into another and overlays onto another. So even the sort of technical way in which music gets put together now, I think, is, is exactly what we were trying to do with a kind of architectural language as well, which I think is a kind of, a, rather than something which has a reading, something which has an overall kind of sensibility that kind of sort of washes over you. So you couldn't exactly pick it apart and say, you know, it's A plus B plus C, but it actually becomes almost a new word because one thing has become something else and you can't see the line between one and another. And if you think about the act of collage, it's so different now than it was when you had to cut it out of a magazine and stick it onto a piece of paper. So that the fact that you can blend things, scale things so easily, you can, you can make them, you can literally make them join up. And I think it came out of those kinds of, those kinds of thoughts, which I think was, was I guess, a, diff, a slightly different sensibility of how you might relate to a world of um, images and references. And it's easy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the kind of Jesus uh, album where every single yeah. sample is so unrecognizable mm. and becomes aggressive. Mm. Because I must say that when I see the buildings again, they look extremely aggressive. Mm. They look aggressive and they seem to express the impossibility to express anything about these people and this poor guy with his bar and then mm. what? In a way, you don't care. I mean, you know, it's like you confront us so much with the impossibility to, to help that guy. And you show that guy completely help us in his kitchen. So in a way, I wouldn't argue that, that you don't care about the person at all. But, but there's obviously, uh, I mean, you, you don't resolve it. It's unresolved, and you are very well aware of it. I have the impression. I mean, when Venturi and Scott Brown use these fragments, there is a certain naivety, I think, especially amongst Scott Brown, that there is a kind of sociological uh, kind of impossibility to help these people. But when I see the work you present, uh, you seem to have accepted the fact that there's no images to be found, there's no images which would match, and that every image in a way is already an abstraction of an abstraction of another image, and they always blur. I don't know. I think there's definitely, there's definitely been an aggression to the work, I think, and that's one of the, I think that's one of the reasons that we feel the project has, has resolved itself. It's like, but the, aggress the aggression was born out of, I suppose, um, Essentially, essentially out of a critique of the way in which, of the circumstances that we found ourselves in, and especially to do with how architecture is used in, especially Britain, that being our circumstance. Like what it's used, you know, why it's commissioned, why people want to have architecture, which are usually absolutely appalling reasons. And of course, they don't really want architecture. What they want is an image of architecture. What they want is a kind of good taste. And that's what you're being... Our projects, essentially, was always to try and confound that. And that's where the kind of a, a visual aggression and, uh, I suppose, um, dissonance and uh, um, lack of cohesion and refusal to resolve comes from, I think, mm -hmm. is to actively make it difficult for people to like it and I think that was obviously a ridiculous well it was a beautiful idea for us for a long time but it was also obviously a ridiculous idea why would you know why would anyone why would any architect want people not to like their work on the other hand I think that kind of aggression that kind of uh, uh, kind of attack on let's say the the, the, the sort of uh, sensibility of the discipline is far more um, and I think that was our kind of naivety that was our kind of youthfulness you know, that was us when we were in our late 20s that was us taking on the world using architecture as the kind of mechanism to do that and of course 
you know, like every project, it, it can, it, we always felt that on many levels that they worked on, you know, the level of a plan. They worked on making a guy a nice kitchen, as well as being a kind of attack on the taste regimes of the people who were commissioning world-class architecture. Those idiots. <laughs> that, so I, I think, yeah, I think you're right to say that it, it does try to be aggressive. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the sort of lack of meaning. I think there is a like, there is a, a over-processed, over-abstracted version of familiarity. I think which characterises the work. True, but I mean, it's so over-processed that very often, I mean, at a certain point you show a sign in wood at the Hochfeld. Mm. If you don't say it's a traffic mixed with this, mixed with that, quite frankly, you didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't think I don't. But I don't think it relies on it in it on it stating those things. And I think part of that, part of that kind of absorption of one thing into another to create like whatever it was that came out of it, I think was part of the part of the ambition. I think. Can you, that's the last question I asked. I hope there's some questions in the book. Can you then explain from that perspective? Because one of the last projects you showed was the first one, which was the Rotunda, mm. in many ways. I mean, mm. can you explain this? Because there's also this kind of, I would say, manipulation of what you make. So you make a copy of it, but then you make the mold and the inverse. So in a way, you, you distort it so much that people get entirely confused about what they look like. How would you relate that specific project in the Biennale to, to the other work you showed? Because I found, I found also the project, having seen it at the time, was strangely aggressive, even though it was using an entirely common kind of mold or something. And, and can you explain us a little bit, like, why you decided to, to show the mold and its inverse? I mean, what was the thinking there? I think we, in, in that case, I think what, uh, quite a lot of the work has always tried to expose the way in which the work comes into the world. Like it's, on the whole, the projects have been incredibly cheap and uh, only partially architecture in a sense. There's only a certain, part, certain amount of the project which you can make any decision about whatsoever. The rest is kind of like, you know, generic version of that typology. And so there's always been a kind of I suppose a sort of desire to reveal the fact that this is both architecture and not architecture at the same time. And I think that was the same sort of, the same sort of uh, desire with that project was to say, okay, well, this is the mechanism of making the project and we're going to display that. So we're going to show both the thing that's made and the way in which it was made. And that seeing those simultaneously, I think, was supposed to, I suppose, show the, I guess, the mul multiple versions of the same information so that you can see them one against another. Almost like having, you know, the working drawings available. But in this case, it's to do with the fabrication itself. That the fabrication leaves a trace and that the trace itself tells the story. So I suppose that was the, the motivation for displaying all of it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I should give somebody else a word. Please. Did you sell to your commissioners world class architecture as you're saying they're stupid idiots? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we did. <laughs> I guess we yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tiring. It's it's tiring playing, having this kind of double life though of like, uh, <laughs> you know, like. But that's why you're referring to uh, that to the this last application of what you were saying. Um, the, the finishing that that this this is the most charged of of all the operations that you were doing. So this um, half meter. Um, Brick uh, facade of this castle, suppose, was the most charged and this, this world class architecture you were referring to. Is it that? Um, but what do you mean exactly? Yeah. Like, 
<clears throat> it struck me because you were saying that um, the, the the most charged signs of architecture when you were talking about this castle with the bricks and the patterns on it. Oh yeah. That, I, I call it it's housing. Yeah. It looks like a castle. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good castle. Yeah. Um, that is this um, um, the revetment, the the padding. That is this, this is the most charged of. Um, you were saying that taste, value, and culture is interlinked, and this that this this cladding, what then becomes good taste or bad taste. Yeah. So, I, I guess it. I guess something weird happens because obviously it does turn it. I mean, if you're playing with these kinds of things, like the, what's essentially kind of vernacular or bad taste, and turning it into something which approximates architecture or at least performs in the world like it's architecture and goes around calling itself architecture and appears in architecture magazines and goes to architecture exhibitions and is authored by people who call themselves architects. I think it does do something because it does immediately become let's say tasteful. It does, it does immediately become a kind of uh, acceptable and I think one of the yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's a uh, that's partly to, that's partly something we've handled by the kind of overscaled aggression that we've had towards those kinds of things. Like there's there are lots of schools of within architecture where those kinds of references are used, and they're used in a kind of way which which makes them more acceptable. It makes them more tasteful. It makes them more palatable. And I think the the, the sort of the, the way we've handled those elements has made them more difficult to accept, in a sense. But um, the fact that it's thin, well, it's actually real brick. It's very authentic, that project. It's not just that thin. But it's actually even trying to look like it's a cladding, I suppose. <laughs> you're, right, you're right to say that. Um, yeah, but it, and in that project, it was certainly the, the negotiation between the two, the fact that it was definitely looked at as regeneration and new but also something that we wanted to connect back to exactly the world that it, that regeneration project was destroying and I think it was that kind of joining up of the circle which was something which drove the intent of the project yeah. I have a slightly provocative question. Um, you said that you tried to make architecture that people don't like, uh, in a way. Uh, so my question to you is, do you like your architecture? That's a, that's, yeah, not, that's, a, that's a very good question, actually. I think, I think there's something to be said for... Okay, so the problem with the word like... You know, like there's a question of whether we should like things, or whether things are like certainly inevitable. Um, I was giving a talk the, the other day about um, Adolf Loth's Tribune Tower, and there's an amazing quote that Loth uh, gives about the tower. He says, like something like, um, uh, the, you know, the, the tower must be built, you know, if not by the Chicago Tribune, by somebody else, if not in Chicago, somewhere else. If not by me, then by another architect. And it's almost as though in that project, Lois is saying, look, this is the inevitable product of the culture which, which, you know, which, which surround, surrounded him. So the project itself is, is, in a sense, ironic, perhaps even sarcastic, because it's a comment on the world, as well as being the world. And I think that's something which is probably a good explanation for a lot of our attitude, is it's a comment on as well as being. And I think that means that they're not necessarily things that we like on an aesthetic level, but they're things which we drove ourselves into because they were also acting as a form of commentary. So I think this is exactly the dialogue about taste, for example, is it acts as 
commentary on, on the way in which taste performs in the built environment. So I would say most likely I don't really like it, <laughs> but that that's really important. And I think that liking stuff is, is really overrated. I think that architecture is not there to be liked. Architecture is there to do something far more important than that. I also have something crossed my mind. You, you stop your band, right? And the band had not just a singer, but also a guitar player and a bass, or I don't know how your band is exactly. Mm. You were three? Three drummers. <laughs> no, but um, I was wondering if you all three, to your knowledge, of course, uh, have the same approach to, to this. I mean, if, I mean, you as, I mean, every time we see a band splitting up, we realize, apart from the fact that they will never be as good as they were together, uh, that, you know, they also had a very different role in that. Mm. I'm not so much talking technically, but also mm. to how you relate to that work. How do you see that yourself? Yeah, I think that's I think that's true, but I think it's it, it's um, I think that's something that we also wanted to escape. Like uh -huh. if you think of a if you think of a band, like a band of, often has a kind of narrative which is out of control of its own authors, mm -hmm. um, if, even though obviously they set it in motion. And I feel that that's maybe something which happened to us. To us. To, yeah, and that we wanted to we we felt like that. We needed, you know, we couldn't bear being the Ramones anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> we had to, um, and, but I think that, I mean, we've the way that we've worked has often been pretty individual. Like, a, even though it, everything's authored by us, mm -hmm. you know, that the actual story of the project is very related to a particular person and a particular sensibility. But that's always been played against a, a sort of central narrative. Mm -hmm. Like how, what that would mean when I suppose we have like more freedom to say well I, d I like this or I don't like this because in a sense we haven't had that freedom to do that because it has to be true to the narrative not true to the personality mm. and I think that that's a, that would be a big change but maybe if you know if you'd asked um, Sean or you'd asked Charles to to speak you'd have had a very different talk and I think one of the reasons that I would that I would say architecture is commentary as much as it is physical substance is because that's what I spend a lot of time doing as well. Like right. I, I write a lot. As I, I want materials to perform the same way that text does. I want buildings to be as kind of uh, um, as legible in a sense or as articulate um, or able to offer a critique as much as a bit of writing can. And so that's like my demand of architecture, I think which produces, I think, a certain way of describing this work as much as it produces that work, I'd say. Hmm. Sam, I got a, a question about me, because tonight you mainly spoke about what I would say 10% of the project, no? So let me say the final appearance hmm. of it. But obviously when you do a project there are other things, no? Like, size, organization, mm. laying out the plans. So it takes, even in time, not in a quarter, a big, a big, uh, it's a big part of the project again. So uh, my question is, on that level, you got a sort of, I would say, automatic pilot, you know? You, I don't know, take plans out of handbooks and, and it's just there, you know? it's not a problem for you. Or, even there, you sometimes apply the same level of effort, uh, yeah, knowledge, um, references, whatever. No? Just to understand uh, yeah, the, the rest of it. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, I mean, we had, a, we had a, uh, a, a slogan many years ago, which was called Taste Not Space. And it was, a, I suppose, a direct, direct reaction to you know, the kinds of things which have characterized a lot of architecture over the last, like, 15 years, for example. Um, and it, that was a... It was, again, a, you know, an, an, an aggressive statement against some stuff. And for, for a while, we, I think, believed in that. We didn't want to be interested in space. We wanted to be interested in taste instead. Now... 
uh, that's not to say that the projects weren't spatially and organisationally engaged, but it wasn't the kind of central narrative of what our project was, because it was explicitly rejecting those kinds of those kinds of things. So it would never have kind of organogram diagrams. You know, we would we wouldn't be Dutch and do those diagrams and wouldn't turn our buildings into diagrams, so we would never draw them. Um, they would never be, they would never be histrionic spatially. Um, and so I think we, we fell into a kind of way of talking about our projects, which was to emphasize their image quality rather than any other of their attributes. Um, but I think you could go back and do the same could do the same talk and talk about it from a completely different perspective, with a set of drawings and no no photographs. I think which would which would which would be maybe a good thing to do. But um, yeah, I I think it came from a certain sort of polemic against certain other ideas of what architecture was about, and that there were a rejection of those and saying no, we will only talk about it in terms of image, and not about it from any other perspective. I see you might uh, already have an answer maybe, is uh, if uh, postmodernism was uh, a certain reaction to say, modernism international style, is your architecture a reaction to a certain regionalism, like uh, British regionalism? I think you could call... I'm sorry, I'm not so, I'm such an expert on the very recent uh, British uh, architecture history or... Yeah. I think I think it's right. I think if postmodernism was a reaction to modernism, ours was a reaction to neo-modernism. Like ours was a reaction to the kind of soft, uh, sort of abstracted, den denuded form of modernism which came into being in Britain in the mid '90s and became associated with, uh, especially Tony Blair and. New Labour and regeneration, and uh, uh, a certain kind of renaissance, in, in many ways, of British design, which of course appalled us. We thought it was, we thought it was terrible and disgusting, <laughs> an abuse. Um, so maybe that's right. Maybe that does explain a certain, a certain. Well, the, the question the customer was talking about, like why everything is illegible, why it refuses to have any particular readable meaning, is because it's, it was reacting against something which was already it, you know, a, a completely postmodern version of modernism. So that the target, the, you know, the targets were different. The targets weren't more because there was no difference between high, there is no difference between high and low anymore. So that, you know, the juxtaposition of Rome to Las Vegas doesn't have any traction, you know, I mean, maybe it did in 68, but it doesn't in 2014. So maybe if I'm saying that our work was very reactive to the circumstances, then maybe that's a, a good explanation is that the target was much more slippery. The target is much more kind of uh, the product of kind of Third way politics, neoliberal um, economic development. So that maybe, maybe that does explain why there's a certain sort of diff you know, the difference in the way in which we handled things from the say classic high postmodernism. Just just last comment to myself. Don't you find it ironical that when as, even though you start an argument against to a certain extent authorship and through this uh, idea of the double and the copy and so mm. forth, and, and you, you question uh, the, the, the originality of the signature of the architect mm. in many ways, that now when you dismember the band, that you actually look back at the work and you realize that so much about signature, that the work is so specific, so recognizable, uh, you know, so much a signature band. Mm. I find it fascinating mm. that despite the fact that maybe you were always, I mean, you know, attacking uh, another kind of signature, perhaps, uh, and the heroic architect. And your anti-heroism 
It's, it's almost like as if you realize you have to stop now because your anti-heroism become very heroic. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. And I think it's the, the issue of signature. I think it's one is one which has really plagued us. Actually, it's been a very difficult, mm -hmm. very difficult thing for us to handle, especially when, as you say, we were perhaps almost one of the easiest people to caricature, like you know what a fat project would would look like. anybody could anybody could draw them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, um, but maybe that was also maybe there was something in the kind of the overly obviousness of it which was against it being you know it was so easy to replicate you know don't you think i think it's very hard to <laughs> yeah i mean yes and no right it's recognizable but hard to copy it's kind of the mees of <laughs> yeah <laughs> more mees than you ever wanted to realize yeah, yeah. I, just, I, think I mean there must be a reason why in chicago now right yeah yeah, yeah. It's my Miesian side, yeah. which you, I think you can tell. There's, there's a very strong Miesian sensibility. On the sun, on the sun. No, I, I can't bear that. So that's the only thing we've done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks.